Thank you for joining uh, the Community Compass's rollout of our standard operating procedures. This is one of two sessions that we have to introduce you to our new SOPs. Today's topic is on work plan development and submission to HUD. Uh, and we are so pleased to finally be sharing these with you. The um, intent of the procedures is really to um, ensure consistent implementation of the requirements, uh, resolve any ambiguity that may have been there before. We are not offering new requirements. This is really meant to just clarify uh, the, the operating procedures around adhering to the requirements already outlined in the notices of funding availability, the federal regulations, and uh, under the terms and conditions associated with your award. We understand over time that uh, your experience with different HUD program offices and with different GTRs may have uh, led to confusing expectations about how you are meant to um, develop and, and submit different documents. And so we hope that by the end of this session today, you will be clear on how, what you are expected to submit to HUD and how HUD will be approaching our review uh, and ensuring a consistent application across our programs. We are also, uh, through this training, increasing your awareness of your role with, and, and also the role of others in the TA process. And our goal overall, really, with outlining these SOPs and issuing them to you all is, one, to be responsive to you as our partners who have indicated that um, without them it had been uh, confusing at times, but two, to ensure that we are um, mitigating administrative burden on your end uh, by having to tailor submissions in different ways, and also, most importantly, mitigating risk to the program by ensuring that there is a shared understanding of the requirements and a shared mechanism for how we will all comply with the requirements. I want to acknowledge that uh, as of this training, all stakeholders at HUD have been trained and uh, agree to enforce them in a similar fashion. So all GTRs across the Technical Assistance Division and CPD, as well as the Procurement and Contract Services and PIH, are trained uh, on these SOPs and will be administering them jointly with TAD. Uh, also, all GTMs and Program Office Technical Assistance Coordinators across Program Offices at HUD have uh, received a training with regard to their role in supporting implementation of both the workman and the voucher SOP that you'll hear from later. So uh, we are very encouraged and excited to share with you all the, the new standard operating procedures that we will all adhere to moving forward. Uh, before I turn it over, I want to say that um, the, a team at HUD has worked really hard on these. All of TAD has contributed. We also consulted a team of five TA firms to get their perspective on what was unclear uh, or to push back if implementation was um, uh, difficult from their perspective. We factored that in before issuing the final version of this SOP. Um, I want to, in particular, highlight the hard work of Jessica Yurtishin, Nikki Bowser and Takia Worthy in the Technical Assistance Division as they led the development and training for all of uh, all of the work plan SOPs that we've rolled out. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Nikki to walk you through uh, the first part of the SOP. Okay, so hello everybody. My name is Nikki Bowser. I am a GTR in TAD and a member of the work plan SOP. Um, work uh, of the SOP, and I work along with um, Jessica Yurchison and Takia Worthy. Um, so today's agenda, we will include um, uh, we will include a we'll go briefly go over the purpose for having a work plan SOP, an overview of how the SOPs are organized. Then we'll get the, get into the reminders for reviewing work plans. Now, before we get into the purpose of the SOPs, I want to let you know that the implementation of the work plan SOPs will be effective or are effective um, on Monday, or were effective on Monday, June 1st, and that's going to be for any assignments that are made starting June 1st um, that your work plan should, um, should comply with the SOPs. 
So why do we need work plan SOPs? They operationalize the requirements in the cooperative agreement. They satisfy the department's requirement for internal controls to reduce mismanagement of federal funds and to manage risk associated with the administration of an award. The SOPs also standardize the way work plans are reviewed to increase consistency and efficiency in our operations. And the SOPs are organized by definitions, roles, and responsibilities. Um, we, we also spelled out the work plan approval process, and the SOPs are organized by type of work plan. Um, then they're also, we go into the resubmission of a work plan, as well as amendments and modifications. So have you ever really considered or gave it much thought about the number of different work plan types that we have? So there are about 10 work plan types, and I say about 10 because other direct TA includes different types of work, such as on-call and regional outreach. So the SOPs explain the approval process by work plan type and details the different requirements that are needed in both DRGR and the portal. So these work plan types come from the latest NOFA and explains the activities associated with each of these. So all work plan types will have the basics you see here, one through nine. Then there are other elements or requirements that are found in DRGR only or in the TA portal only. And it's important to note that some of the, the terms used in the portal and DRGR mean the same thing. For instance, performance measures in DRGR is the same as outputs in the portal. So I won't go over every or all the elements such as grant number, work plan type, or work plan number because the SOP will remind you of what these elements look like. So let's start by looking at the period performance. So the takeaway here is that the period of, period of performance should not be a random time frame. You should consider the level of HUD involvement, your in, the input from the POTAC or GTM, and the complexity of the work assigned. Um, your start date should not be any earlier than the assignment of the work, and the end date um, should allow for trail and cost to be accounted for and gives you also enough time to close the work plan. When identifying a period of performance for a task, recipients should factor in the GTR's 30-day review period, so all tasks may not have the same start date as the overall work plan start date. So here's a list of items that should be included in the scope. All items that should be included in a work plan aren't listed here, so it is important to refer to the SOPs for all of the requirements. But let's look at the sixth item on the list, which is description of coordination efforts with other recipients to deliver TA. This should be included in the scope if there are other recipients that will be involved with involved in the delivery of the TA. And if TA surveys will be administered, the scope should have language that indicates which recipient will initiate the survey. And also important to note here is that any non-key personnel changes that, um, that do occur, that should be noted or captured in your scope as well, as, um, as well as any justifications for amendments. Now tasks, tasks are achievable activities. The task name should be a descriptive title. Um, the start and end dates should fall within the work plan period performance. Um, the task should include an estimated cost and budget per task. And the narrative should define eligible activities that are within the parameters of the scope. So important to note here at the bottom of this slide um, is within the task narrative is it should include the labor categories, 
with hours per task. In addition to the labor categories and hours, the SOP states that you should include the name or names of key personnel associated with the task. The sixth item on the quality checklist states cannot, um, that comment that says cannot enter CTA portal. Um, this means that you, you must provide language for the task narrative. And if the TA will be delivered jointly with other recipients, you should be including the other recipients' roles and responsibility for the, the respective task. And circle to the left here indicates that all work plans should have at least one task for project management and coordination. So under the proposed staff section of the work plan, you want to make sure that for all TA staff types, you want to, um, in the social, uh, all, I'm sorry, make sure that for all TA staff types, and associate, um, associate that staff type with the individual or staff name. You want to make sure that that is included. Um, in this snippet, you see that I associated myself with the staff, with the staff executive type. Then the sum of the individual personnel rates, which is at the bottom right corner here, should be equal to or less than the proposed or less than the total proposed staff budget that I've circled at the top of this snippet. Of course, you know that only approved rates should be included on a work plan, but recipients can ask staff that has a pending rate, but that rate should be approved before incurring costs for that individual. And high weight, high, I'm sorry, and high wage rate individuals should be used strategically and reserved to address more complex TA activities. GTRs will monitor the number of hours that a high wage rate individual works on a work plan for reasonableness. So next, we have other BLI calls. You know that BLI calls should have start and end dates, have a descriptive title with a total, but a notable change to the requirement is the segregation of travel costs. Your GTR will check for the number of trips proposed, the unit costs by trip, and the number of people per trip. We also want to, want to see the destination and point, point of origin if known at the time of work plan development. Organization assistance should always be included on your work plan when you have that information. If an organization is identified in your scope or the TA recipients are listed in the portal under assignment, you should populate this field in DRGR. For product development and training work plans in the portal, TA recipients assisted, assisted is not required. AA, AAQ work plans don't require organizations assisted to be, um, do not require organizations um, assisted to be provided as well. And we, and we also know that the organization assisted may not be an option to select in DRGR because all possible entities have not been added to the drop down option. So at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that there are, um, there are um, additional elements or criteria that are required for DRGR in the portal. For instance, um, learning objectives, they are required in the portal for product development and training delivery only work plans. I highlighted milestones and performance measures because these are often overlooked when work plans are developed, milestones are only captured in DRGR, and you should have at least one milestone per work plan. The SOPs define milestones. They are a schedule or a plan for delivering, delivering the assistance 
and may include a list of planned site visits or meetings with the customer field office and or the headquarters staff. And performance measures are in DRGR and are equivalent to outputs in the portal in respect to facilitating progress monitoring. Recipients should enter proposed totals and quantities for the performance measures that are listed. Now, if the measures don't fit the proposed activities, you need to indicate so by entering an A. Now, GTRs will be looking for, for the performance measures in DRGR and will ask you to update the work plan to, to include it if it is left blank. Again, here's a snippet of performance measure, measures listed in DRGR for a direct TA work plan. The measures are auto-populated based on the work plan type selection. And all work plans in the portal should have at least one outcome per task or one that applies to the whole work plan. The outcome should reflect meaningful change or changes on the community and is measurable and reflect near-term results. Also in the portal are HUD strategic goals. You should select at least one from the latest HUD strategic plan and if applicable, one from the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. So at this point, do you have any questions about the requirements needed for the criteria, criteria, criteria that we discussed? And do you know where to find what the eligible activities are for a work plan type? And what is the most appropriate work plan type to select for the proposed TCA? Um, the latest NOFA provides detailed purposes or activities of the different types of work plans. And you can also look at the assignment. It, it will give you some insight for the eligible task. And at this point, I will turn it over to Jessica to go over important work plan reminders. Pass Thanks, it to Jessica. Jessica. You're welcome. One second. There we go. All right, so for some reminders, and um, the first one is on the review time frame. And for work plan types that are only submitted in DRGR, the review timeframe begins once the work plan is submitted in the system. The recipient, as soon as the work plan is submitted, must send an email to the GTM or POTAC copying the GTR with a PDF of the work plan submitted. Now for work plan types that go both in the TA portal and DRGR, the review clock begins once the work plan is submitted in both systems. Since the portal sends an alert to the GTM and GTR, there's no need to send an email. GTMs or POTAX have 15 days to review the work plan in consultation with HUD subject matter experts or, and or field office representatives and provide feedback and or recommend approval. GTRs have 15 days to review work plan, a period that starts at the end of the GTM review period. However, the GTR can start the review as soon as the work plan is submitted instead of waiting for GTM or POTAC approval. The 15 days for GTM and POTAC review is included in the total 30-day review period. Now, the second reminder is on event requests and use of non-HUD space agreements. For work plans that require event request approval, the recipient is to work with the GTM or POTAC to get approval since they know the process well. Work plans with pending event requests can be conditionally approved prior to event request approval. However, work plan approval does not constitute approval for the event. The role of the GTM or POTAC in the event process is to ensure compliance with the program office approval process. When the GTM or POTAC reviews the work plan, he or she should include language in the assignment, scope, or comment section, indicating that the event request approval process has been considered and is underway. Once the event request is approved, if, if applicable, the GTM or POTAC attached, attaches proof of approval in the portal with comments and notifies both the recipient and the GTR via email. 
Now, for work plans that require use of non-HUD space, the recipient is to submit a copy of the space agreement to their GTR prior to executing. The GTR will then forward the agreement to the designated HUD point of contact. Once approved, the GTR notifies the recipient via email and by adding comments to the work plan. Work plans with pending use of, agree pending use of space agreement may be conditionally approved prior to written approval, just like work plans require, require an event approval. However, work plan approval does not constitute approval for the use of space. Now, additional reminders on, the first one is on training. Does the training require the development of products and the delivery of the training? If the answer is yes, then the TA engagement must be separated into two work plans. Again, that is two work plans, one for product development and one for training delivery. If, um, now, another reminder on online tools and products. If the work plan includes an online tool or product, recipients must budget for making the tool or product 508, 508 compliant and for reviewing website posting options with manager of HUD platform and HUD. This must be included in one of the tasks of the work plan. Now, for all in-person and online trainings and conferences sponsored by, by HUD, use of the Learning Management System, or LMS, on the HUD Exchange for registration and managing participants is required. In addition, recipients must enter information about attendees at in-person trainings and group learning sessions in the LMS as this information is reported to Congress. Therefore, recipients must include coordination activities with manager of HUD platform in the work plan. To receive an exception from the LMS requirement, the program office will need to receive cooperative agreement officer approval. Some examples of exceptions include trainings or conferences at HUD headquarters because of the need to collect security information upon registration, and trainings with the Office of Native American Programs, or ONAP since the office does not use LMS for online trainings. Recipients are encouraged to work with the POTAC or GTN to determine whether LMS will be used. Now, a reminder on task and scope. Task narratives and scope in DRGR and the portal should have detailed information. As much as possible, information must be directly entered into the DRGR work plan since DRGR is the official system of record for TA activities. Simply entering C portal, CTA portal is not acceptable unless you have reached the character limit in DRGR. The information that you're not able to capture will be supplemented by attaching the work plan in the portal as supporting documentation in DRGR. Therefore, there's no need to summarize the narrative in DRGR. This slide is a quick reminder that staff type in DRGR must match labor categories, categories in the portal. So on this slide, you see that a program manager and CFO are listed in both systems, um, both DRGR on the left side and the portal on the right side. Now, a reminder of modifications and amendments. When, we, when recipients submit amendments or modifications, they must list in the scope, the date, the changes of the, to the work plan, and reason or justification for the change in the portal and DRGR. So in both systems, these, this information must be entered. The SOPs provide template language that must be used by recipients. More information on what is a modification versus an amendment can be found in the SOPs in the section that covers procedures for submitting work plan amendments and modifications. Now, prior approvals. In the SOPs, we include some changes that require prior approval. Changes that require prior approval are included in 2 CFR Part 200.407. The first one that we want to highlight is change in modality in which activities are developed or delivered. So, for example, if a training goes from being online to in-person, that change would require prior approval. Um, 
On the other hand, um, or in the same light, a training that goes from being in-person to online would also require prior approval. Now, another prior approval example or a change that would require prior approval is a change in key personnel assigned to, um, assigned to a HUD approved work plan. Um, another change would be also a change in period of performance, including the extension of the work plan's end date, even if it doesn't include a budget change. Um, so any changes in the period of performance, whether 90 days, whether 30 days, these all would require prior approval. Um, in addition, a cumulative increase in the HUD approved work plan budget by 10% or more would also require prior approval. Um, some changes, or some, something to note is that changes made to the work plan in DRGR must also be made in the PA portal. Um, and what we mean by prior approval is that um, prior approval is, once the amendment is submitted, um, the approval is granted when the work plan is approved in DRGR and the portal with concurrence of the GTM or POTAC. All right, so now for implementation of the new SOPs. Um, the implementation will begin on June 1st, 2020, just like Nikki mentioned. Work plan amendments that come in, um, in on or after June 1st should be compliant as well. However, we are currently drafting supplemental instructions that will exclude some of the new standards from being retroactively applied. So for example, the itemization of travel in um, under other BLI, a GTR will not be reject or approved with conditions that your amended work plan needs to be updated to meet this new travel budget standard. Um, on, the other, on the other hand, you may need to submit an amendment for a work plan that is missing the organization assistance. Though this is not a new requirement, this, the, the consistent enforcement of it, of it is, and you can expect comments from GTRs that reflect the need to update, update this field moving forward, even for amendments. Additional guidance on the exceptions for amendments will be provided soon. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over questions and turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you so much for um, viewing this webinar today. We hope that you find that it's useful as you implement the SOPs that we've uh, posted on the Community Compass guidance webpage and also distributed via email. Um, we will be posting a summary of questions and answers that we received when we did the live webinar session. Uh, we'll be posting that online and making them available via email as well. Uh, but, but as always, please email your uh, GTR or communitycompass at hud.gov if you have questions um, throughout the process. We're hoping that uh, our staged implementation, acknowledging the fact that you have work plans already underway or work previously tasked, uh, you know, giving you some grace to, to continue that under your previous understanding of the requirements um, and, and sort of a grace period for you to um, submit a new for new tasking. Uh, shows our commitment to doing this in partnership with you all. We hope that you find it clarifies and smooths over your interactions with GTRs and program offices and ultimately relieves the burden of administering our program, even if it means that some things are enforced at a higher level than you were used to in the past, uh, being clear about the expectation and removing the ambiguity uh, should at least um, make more clear what, what you're doing and, um, and therefore be a, a lighter load um, from your perspective. In the future, we will be looking at enhancements to streamline uh, these protocols and the way that we operationalize them in HUD systems. So more to come on that. This is, this is step one. It's just getting us all standardized and on the same page. Thank you again. We cannot deliver TA without your partnership. We are very grateful for the work that you do, and we know um, that that the administrative side uh, is important, but not your main focus. And we we appreciate your attention to these details so that we can ensure a more expedited uh, and clear review process. Take care.